Okay, now on to the final classes of Arthropoda and the final video of the week, the arachnids and the insects, arachnida and insecta. So this is the class arachnida. These are commonly known as the spiders, the mites, the ticks, and the scorpions. Now, later on the semester, we're going to be going over a couple of these arachnids in much more detail, but I'm going to give you the basics now. The first thing that all arachnids have in common are they all have chelicera and pedipalps or pedipalpi. So, chelicera are mouth parts. These arise from forward in the head, and these are what we know of as of the fangs of spiders. Mm -mm. They assist during feeding, so they will help keep food in the mouth. They can maybe inject something and do that sort of thing. So on this spider, these bright green things here are the fangs or the chelicera. The second organ, the pedipalpi. These are um, predatory organs. They're modified appendages that are predatory organs. They usually arise from further back on the head. Uh, the most ex obvious example of pedipalps are here on the scorpion. You can see they've got these uh, um, claw-like organs right here. These aren't legs. These are pedipalps. Spiders have pedipalps too. They just sort of look like these extra pairs of legs right here. So all arachnids have both pedipalps and chelicera of some sort arising from various portions of the head. The second ma major characteristic found in all arachnids is they all lack a pair of antennae. So if you remember from those last videos, the crustaceans have two pairs of antennae, while both diplopoda and chilopoda each have one pair of antennae. Well, Arachnids have none. So this is where they normally would go. You got these eyes, see the chelicera and the uh, pedipalps here. No antennae are found on the head of these organisms. Up next is the number of legs. And this is probably the most famous thing for arachnids. I mean, how old are you in uh, grade school when you learn that spiders have eight legs, right? So all arachnids have four pairs of legs for eight pairs in, or eight legs in total. So here's uh, an example of three different types of arachnids. You got your spider up here at the left. You got one, two, three, four pairs of legs. Your scorpion here, one, two, three, four pairs of legs. Remember these big things up the front are the pedipalps. And this is a tick. You've got one, two, three, and four pairs of legs. So all arachnids have eight legs total, all arising from that uh, cephalothoracic region. Which brings us to our last characteristic. Spiders or arachnids, again, have two body regions, that cephalothorax and the abdomen. So just like crustaceans, we have this head and thoracic uh, melding into the cephalothorax, and it's from the cephalothoracic region where all these legs arise. Then you've got the sort of bulbous other portion, which is the abdomen. <clears throat> So two body regions, the cephalothorax and the abdomen. All right, so there are quite a few veterinarily important uh, groups found within arachnida. Oh, we're gonna talk about two orders now. So we've gone kingdom, phylum, class, arachnida. Now we're breaking it down to the next section, the orders. For the rest of the semester, you're gonna be hearing about different orders of insects and a few more orders of arachnids. But today I would like to tell you about two orders we just won't have a lot of time to talk about later on in the semester. This first order is the scorpions. <clears throat> scorpions are pretty re easy to identify, right? They have that elongated ab abdominal region. It, in most species, they carry that abdomen upright and curled over the back of the cephalothorax. There's a, a venom gland at the tip of that abdomen. See that right here? right here, right here. Okay, so that venom gland is used to strike or to sting in self-defense. The sting can be pretty dangerous. This is what makes scorpions um, pretty veterinarily important when it comes to uh, animals. So it can be pretty dangerous and it may result in the death of animals and of humans if you get the wrong type of scorpion. 
Scorpion venom tends to act on the nervous system. This can result in extreme localized pain, and it may cause respiratory failure. Scorpions are especially dangerous to small animals. Uh, that small body size, it doesn't take a lot to you know, break that down, and it doesn't take a lot to cause respiratory failure. <clears throat> We have a lot of different anti-venoms out on the market, however, so um, if and when you become a vet or you go into animal care, you're going to want to know the types of scorpions that are in your area because you're likely going to get some sort of animal coming in that has been stung by a scorpion. You may need to help this animal that's in distress. <clears throat> One interesting thing about scorpions is that they glow under a UV light. This is due to a substance in their exoskeleton, and it makes them give off this bluish greenish glow that you can see here under UV. This makes it very easy to find them at night, just in case you want to go scorpion hunting. There are 18 species of scorpion found in Texas. Most of them are found in the area of Big Bend. Okay, so that Big Bend National Park area, that's where you're going to find most of your scorpions. None of the scorpions are considered deadly, but there are some that do have a really, really painful sting. And they do have that neurotoxin venom that can cause some problems, especially with smaller animals. Most species of scorpion live somewhere between three to eight years, but there are a few that can live upwards of 25 years, especially if they're living in captivity. The most common uh, species found here in Texas is the Centroides vitatus. This is the striped bark scorpion. These species mate during the fall, uh, and then they reproduce during the spring and the summer. So you're going to see them most commonly uh, with little babies hanging out on their back during spring and summer months outdoors. They live uh, under rocks, they live under boards, they live in debris outside, and sometimes they will be found indoors. They're especially common in the pine forest in East Texas. They like uh, the rocky slope region, they like grasslands, and they like juniper breaks. Uh, these guys are active foragers. They don't burrow, so they don't make their own little homes. Instead, they prefer dead ve vegetation they can kind of get under. They like getting underneath fallen logs, and they like human dwellings. So they like coming inside people's houses and just turning that into their house. <clears throat> they do like to climb. So uh, they've been reported up in the attics of people who have attics in their home. Uh, there was one student that I talked to a couple of years back where she said every single year at her parents' house, they would have to be very careful the first time they opened their attic uh, in the uh, spring or in the summer because there'd just be hundreds of scorpions that would fall down. So they like going up high in those regions. As a general rule, these uh, species, this, the species of scorpion, will remain sheltered in the daytime and become very active at night. It does this to regulate its body temperature, and it helps to keep its water in balance. That way it's not losing all that water because of that high surface-to-volume ratio. So this species isn't especially dangerous. It does sting, uh, and that sting is painful, and it will produce this localized swelling if and when you get stung. That sting may persist for several days. The reaction, your individual reaction to the venom, however, is going to be based on your sensitivity. Same thing with any animal that gets stung. This is, it's very common, especially in this area, for animals like dogs to go after a scorpion, get stung, and they can have some swelling, they can have some pain, and they can be relatively upset. Uh, for the most part, though, those stings aren't lethal. Um, not even in really tiny animals. They will produce that swelling. Uh, you will see some discoloration. You'll see some numbness and some pain. There's been some reported deaths in animals and humans from these, but those are unsubstantiated. The amount of venom that is uh, injected during a sting doesn't make any sense that it would actually kill somebody. So we don't have any actual substantiated reports that they have caused death. Uh, an antivenom for this species really isn't necessary. It just would cost extra money 
really. And so whatever animal, whatever human gets stung, you just sort of have to write it out. You can take some painkillers, but other than that, you don't really need an antivenom. All right. The second order that I want you to know are the Ariani or the spiders. Uh, now, just to be upfront, all spiders are venomous. So they do have venom glands. These venom glands are found at the base of their chelicera, and they use these venom glands to subdue their prey. However, most spiders are not dangerous, even with this venom. Either they cannot bite us, or this venom just doesn't cause any problems when they do. There is one very common spider in Texas, the tarantula. You can see a picture of it in that upper left up there. Tarantulas are not dangerous, especially not these little cute brown tarantulas that we find here in Texas. They do have some venom glands, like all spiders, and they can bite, but when they do, they just don't cause any harm. It just doesn't really harm us in any way. What's more annoying about them is they can dislodge the hairs on their body, and these hairs can get into your skin and get into your eyes and cause quite a bit of irritation. Here in Texas, they also do a really weird thing. They have an annual migration. So the males will move en masse just across their territories during mating season. So you can end up with just hundreds upon hundreds of spiders walking across the road, walking across your yard. Some will come into your house if it happens to be in the way and the door is open. So they'll just wander in trying to get to the other side. So it's nothing to worry about. It just does tend to freak people out when they see hundreds and upon hundreds of really big spiders just sort of walking across the road. Now, there are two species in Texas that are a cause for concern, especially if you're going to be dealing with animals or with humans. The first is, uh, the scientific name is Letrododecus mactans. This is the black widow. So, it is a shiny black spider with this red hourglass on its ventral abdomen. I'm sure you know what a black widow looks like. The spider produces a neurotoxin. So when it bites you, it causes quite a bit of pain and it can cause cramps and tremors. In really severe cases of this injection with this neurotoxin, you can end up with nausea, chest pain, and ultimately death. It's especially dangerous for small animals and small children. The spiders will produce a or an, an, an irregular mesh web. So that's what this looks like right here. So this is the um, black widow web. So you notice it's not that big, pretty spider web that you, you're used to looking at. It's this irregular sort of mesh-like web. And it builds, it builds it in a very dark spot, a, a sheltered spot, where it's sheltered from the weather and from... Uh, humans and animals and it likes to build it very low to the ground so if you're looking in, like in your garage or in your shed or somewhere like that and you go to this back dark corner near the ground that's where you're most likely to find these spiders mm -mm. the spider itself is very timid it would much rather uh, escape than attack so most animals and uh, humans won't get bit unless they actually corner a black widow somewhere or mess with it quite a bit okay so keep that in mind if you see a black widow you can just walk away it'll be fine even if you do get bit there's a very common anti-venom on the market so it's really easy to get to you can take care of it you can get rid of that pain pretty quickly now the second dangerous spider is luxocles reclusia or the brown recluse there are five closely related Luxocles species in Texas that are venomous, but the other four, other than this brown recluse, are really not any cause for alarm. They don't cause any real problems at all. So if you think you have seen the brown recluse, you probably haven't. It was probably one of these other species that looks kind of like it, but not really. And so it's not nearly as dangerous. Really, the brown recluse is very, very rare. You don't find it many places. And it's really not in this area very often. <clears throat> now, the uh, brown recluse is easily identified. Uh, it has these violin-shaped markings on its uh, dorsal thorax so it looks like a violin you see how this is very obviously a violin right here you got the swoop stuff right there okay so it's got this violin on its um dorsal thorax and overall it is a uh yellow to brownish in color about three eighths to five sixteenths of an inch long 
they live under logs, they live under stones, they live in very sheltered areas. Every once in a while, they might be found indoors, but they're found in undisturbed areas. So you find, find them in dark back corners, in trunks, under stored clothing, around undisturbed structures, places where they're not going to be bothered on a regular basis. So these aren't the ones that are like coming into your house and wandering around on the walls. They don't like people. They don't like animals. They don't like a lot of things of that nature. If you do see them moving around, you're most likely to see them moving around at night. So they are nighttime hunters. They'll go out at night, they will hunt for prey, and then they will hide during the day. Now, the venom of the brown recluse is very harmful to humans and animals. The bites are going to form this red circular area on the skin, and then that area is just going to slough off, leaving this really huge, really nasty open wound. This wound is really, really hard to heal. It can take several months to heal, and it takes a long time to completely just skin over that really large wound. It takes a lot of doctor intervention to make sure it doesn't get infected. <clears throat> Luckily, this spider is a lot like the, brown, the uh, black widow. It's not aggressive. It's only going to bite you if it's trapped or if it's injured. So if you see one, you can just walk away. It's not going to chase you down. It, it, it won't come after you. If you, you know, mess with it, it might. But more than likely, you're not going to see one. Always look for those really obvious violin markings. All right. Finally, on to the very last class, the, or the insecta. So the ins insecta are the insects. And we're going to spend a really long time in class talking about different insects this semester. But I'm very quickly going to go over the things that make them all one class. So the first thing is they have three body regions rather than two, like we've seen in every other group thus far. They have a head, a thorax, and an abdomen. So in all the other classes, that head and that thorax are, are bonded together in that cephalothorax. But here you can see we've got a very separate head, a separate thorax, and a separate abdomen. Separate head, thorax, and abdomen on these insects. The next characteristic is the number of legs. So in insects, they have uh, six legs or three pairs of legs total. So different from the arachnids that have eight, different from the crustaceans that have five pairs or more, different from the millipedes and the uh, centipedes, which just have many. So here you can see six legs or three pair arising from the thorax. One, two, three, three on the other side. One, two, three. Here you can see all six from underneath. Here you can see all six. So six pairs of legs total, or six legs total, three pairs total. Next, they have a single pair of antennae. Now, these antennae may be a little hard to see, and they may be in all manner of different forms. So you could have these sort of shorter, thinner ones. You have long, thread-like ones. You have these ones that have the sort of elbow shape. You have all manner of different types of antennae, but they have a single pair of antennae that arise from the head. Now, Insecta has the greatest number of species that are parasites of humans and animals. During the rest of the semester, we're going to be going over the lice, the fleas, the flies, and then some things that aren't insects, some more arachnids, the ticks and the mites. We probably won't get to covering things like the kissing bugs, the blister beetles, or the bed bugs. I might try to put some of these in, especially if they make it into the news, but in general, we may not see these. We'll see how it goes. Okay. All right, well, you've made it through your first week. So your next quiz is going to be over this last, these last six videos. Um, make sure you, can, you listen to these as well as you can, do your reading, and let me know if you have any questions. Have a wonderful night.